Lord has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. and welcome to Unapologetic. I am so excited today because I have my dad on the show, Dr. Robert Jeffress. He is going to talk to us about his new book, 18 Minutes with Jesus, which is about how the Bible applies to our everyday lives. I don't really think I need to introduce him on the show, but just in case, he is the senior pastor of our church, First Baptist Dallas, a best-selling author, Fox News contributor, the head of the ministry. Pathway to Victory, which uh, supports the show you're listening to right now. And most of all, he is just a lifelong faithful servant of Christ. I am so excited. Please welcome to the show, my dad, Dr. Robert Jeffress. (laughs) Well, thank you, Julia. It's great to be with you. And thanks uh, for having me. Congratulations on the great success of Unapologetic. Oh, thanks. Maybe we should go ahead and tell where all this started, because I think people think it started a year ago. And really, the idea for Unapologetic started when I was five. Can you kind of tell that story? It's never been told before. Well, (laughs) Julia has always had an interest in two things. First of all, evangelism. I've never known anybody more evangelistic Mm. than you are. I mean, starting when you were about five, you were always sharing your faith with people. You were witnessing, first of all, to your sister, and (laughs) she was your first convert. And then your uh, students at school that you went with passing out water bottles bottles with I am the water of life on them. And so you've always been uh, interested in leading people to Christ, and you've always been interested in the media. I don't know where you got that from, (laughs) but you've had very much an interest in media. You used to go with me when you were five and six to do my first interviews on radio and television, and uh, you found a way to marry those two interests in uh, evangelism and in media, and you're doing a great job, and uh, Mm. we're proud out of you. Oh, thank you. Well, anyway, <laughs> enough about me. Let's talk more about you. What do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? I'm not going to change my answer from the last time you asked it. I wish mm-hmm. they would quit apologizing for insisting that Jesus is not just one way, mm-hmm. but the only way to be saved, mm-hmm. because that's not a claim we came up with. It's mm-hmm. what Jesus said in John 14, 6, mm-hmm. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I think we just have to have a mindset that if Jesus is telling the truth, then the most loving thing we can do is point people to that one way to heaven. I wonder how it plays out. Like, how do you think it plays out people apologizing for Jesus being the only way? Because I know like growing up in school, like there were lots of conversations about it because we were learning things and there were class discussions. But in everyday life, how do you think people apologize? Well, I don't think they go around saying, I'm sorry, Jesus is the only way. I think what they do is they hesitate to share that truth with people Mm -hmm. because they don't want to be thought of as being intolerant Mm -hmm. and they don't want to be uh, hateful. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, a few years ago, um, I did an evening at the Reagan Library uh, with Dennis Prager, the well-known mm-hmm. Jewish talk show host on Salem. And the evening was called Ask a Jew, Ask a Gentile. Wow. And uh, the place was packed, the Reagan Library, and they asked all kind of questions. And one of the people asked Dennis Prager, aren't you insulted by Dr. Jeffers' view Mm. that Jesus is the only way to be saved? And aren't you really insulted that he would try to lead you to Mm. faith in Christ? And Dennis Prager had an interesting response. He said, if I believed what Robert believed, I would be insulted if he didn't try to win me to faith in Christ. It's the most loving Mm. thing he could do. Mm. And uh, it's interesting that a Jewish person would understand that. I remind Mm. people all the time, Julia, that this claim of exclusivity isn't something we came up with. It's the teaching of 
the three most prominent Jews mm -hmm. in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Paul was a Jew. He mm -hmm. called himself the Hebrew of the Hebrews. And yet he said, my prayer is that Israel would be saved. Yeah. Peter was a Jew. Mm -hmm. He wasn't Catholic. He was a Jew. <laughs> and Peter said, uh, there's no other name under heaven given among men, which we must be saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus Again, wasn't a Southern Baptist evangelist. He was a Jewish rabbi. And yet right. he said, I'm the only way to heaven. Mm -hmm. So what do you think people can do to kind of combat that? Like, I know my number one go-to thing that I practice and that I tell students and other people encourage them to do, I have a verse that really propels me. So like last week, just getting really practical, I ended up, God definitely ordained this situation. It was someone who just out of nowhere... I ended up in conversation with and she said, I'm so tired of religion. Like I'm exhausted by it. And she said, there has to be a better way. I mean, that, yeah. that rarely happens, yeah, but, but I mean, it, it did. Setup. And something that I've done that I've practiced probably the last decade, my verse is Romans 1 16. It's I am not ashamed of the gospel mm -hmm. of Christ. Yeah. And so like anytime I hesitate in my verse, I, in my head, I say, no, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then that propels me because it's not my gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And so whatever it is, just some little thing that can remind you real quickly of the cost. I think you need to have your own private verse that motivates you. And by the way, that was Paul writing that. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the, not it is a, mm -hmm. it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who mm -hmm. believes to the Jew first and right. then to the Gentile. It's a message for everyone. You know, I think the other thing, Julia, is when you talk to people, people, they hang on to illustrations you yes. use. If you can come up with a good illustration. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I was uh, on an airplane and uh, uh, a guy asked me, I really wasn't in the mood to talk. I'd had a long <laughs> day, but he had asked me what I did. And I told him I was a Christian writer. And so he said, well, I used to be a Christian. And that mm. kind of piqued my interest. And I said, well, what led you to stop being a Christian? And he said, this belief that there's only one way to heaven. Yeah. And uh, I just can't accept a religion that, that's, that mm. is that intolerant and hateful. And so I just came up with this on the spot. I said, imagine this airplane were to crash and uh, the cabin was filling up with smoke and the flight attendant started waving a flashlight saying, follow me, there's one way out of this burning aircraft. Would you accuse her of being hateful wow. and intolerant because she insisted there's only one way out? No, you would follow her and you would thank her. Mm. And that made an impression on him. Yeah. And uh, he said... I haven't decided what I'm going to do, but I'll always remember that illustration. Oh, it's so good. That's fantastic. Well, just switching gears here a little bit, I'm excited about your new book, but something, there were two things that I think um, really stuck out to me growing up in your household. <laughs> and one was teaching us evangelism, teaching us really practically how to share our faith. And then the other thing that I just want to encourage parents with that are watching is you could answer our questions. Mm -hmm. You could answer any question I had. And I know that everyone, of course, is not a pastor. Everyone didn't go to seminary. But we live in a day and age where any parent can research any question their child has and be able to answer it. And I just can't emphasize enough how much it meant to me that you could answer my questions about God and the Bible. Well, Julia, I appreciate that. And I would just uh, agree that parents need to have the answers. Mm -hmm. And I'm not here to try to sell a book, but I would say a book I know you use a lot and mm -hmm. encourage people to use is a book I wrote some years ago titled, How Can I Know? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Answers to the Seven Most Important Questions of Life. And I wrote that book with a guide to help not just individuals, but to help parents be able yeah. to answer their children's questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took basic questions like, how can I know the Bible is true? Mm -hmm. How can I know there is a God? How can I know there's life after death? How can I know Christianity is the right religion? And I used hundreds of books in mm -hmm. preparing this one book. And I said, 
most people aren't going to read an entire book on the inspiration of the Bible. Right. So I'm going to take the best arguments out there and distill them into 30 pages, one chapter. Yeah. And so for every one of those questions, there's a one chapter compilation of the best, clearest examples. Yes. And so I would encourage parents to get a copy of the book, mm -hmm. How Can I Know?, just to keep it on hand mm -hmm. when your kids ask you, you know, how can I know heaven is a real place? Mm -hmm. How can I know the Bible is true and all of these things? We do need to be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks right. us, especially our children, for the hope that is in us. Yes. But let's talk about 18 minutes with Jesus. What I was going to say is y'all really taught you and mom evangelism, and then uh, you taught us you, you could answer our questions about scripture, about Jesus, about Christianity. But lastly, not the only thing, but if I was going to sum it up, next to pray big things, of course. Uh, you taught us how the Bible really has things to say, commands for everyday living. And what I've learned as a counselor, which we all know to be true, you don't have to be a counselor to know this, but everyone ultimately cares about themselves. Yeah. Hopefully that gets redeemed a little bit once you accept Christ and we start to care about other people. But at the end of the day, we leave church on Sunday, we leave our devotional time saying, how does this apply to me? And so I know that um, this book has to do with that. Can you just talk about the book and then we'll kind of get into the specifics? Yeah. People are asking, what do you mean 18 minutes with Jesus? Did you have a near-death experience to go and visit <laughs> Jesus and spend 18 minutes and came back to write about it? That's not what this book is. Uh, uh, many of your listeners, I know, Julia, are familiar with the TED Talks. Mm -hmm. They're very popular right now. They're brief talks by an expert on a topic of great interest. And I had this thought one day. Day, what if Jesus were to come back and give a TED Talk? Mm. What would he talk about? And then it hit me, he's already given his TED Talk. Wow. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, a TED Talk can only be 18 minutes in length. Interestingly, you can read the Sermon on the Mount in 18 minutes. <laughs> and so yet cool. it's about the things we care about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In that brief 18 minutes with Jesus, Jesus addresses uh, your money, uh, your sex life, your prayer life, how to respond to your enemies, your eternal destiny, mm -hmm. your happiness, all of those things mm -hmm. are included on the Sermon on the Mount. So it's really a fresh look at a 2,000-year-old sermon and how it applies not in the hereafter, but in the here and now. Man, that's so fascinating. You know, it's not to say anything bad about my generation, but it's pretty widely known being stereotypical in general, that our generation and the one coming after are pretty biblically illiterate. I mean, I told you, like, I don't even know if most people know what the Sermon on the Mount is. Yeah. Um, and that's even Christians. And so can you just kind of tell us what that setup is and why that was an important moment in Jesus's ministry? Well, this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's attracting large crowds. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of us have been to the Mount of Beatitudes overlooking the Sea of Galilee, where people think he gave this message. The key thing was he had some devoted followers already. He had some curious people. He had some enemies, the religious officials. Yeah. They were all tuned in, and yet Jesus spoke this message that applied to all of them. Mm. I, I remember whenever I really started reading the Bible for myself, because really I got a lot, obviously, on Sundays, and <laughs> I became a Christian when I was young, but it was really in my 20s that I started really studying Scripture for myself, and I remember God just kind of giving me this insight I was still going to suffer. I was still going to be held accountable for the principles and commands in Scripture, whether I knew them or not. That's an eye-opening revelation. I mean, isn't it's it? like I mean, it's straight from God because I was like, I mean, I, it's here. It's up to me if I'm going to read it or yeah, not. Yeah. And I'm going to suffer the consequences. All of us suffer consequences, and. Whether we read it or not and we get that insight, that's up to us. Or whether we believe it or not. <laughs> right, right. And I think, you know, probably a lot of people listening to the show are Christians. And I don't love this thing, but I have heard it before. Like a lot of us are not atheists, but we live as practical atheists. Right. We're like, thank you for the fact that I'm no longer going to go to hell and I've accepted Christ, but we don't really invite principles and commands into our daily life. So can we just talk about some of the high points in your book that are highlighted on the Sermon of the Mount? Well, you know, I, I would say that there are a lot of your listeners right now, maybe who've had the same experience I had. I went years 
without, and I'd have to say 40 years before I ever preached on the Sermon on the Mount, Mm -hmm. because uh, I had been taught in seminary that the Sermon on the Mount isn't for today. It's the constitution for how we're going to live in the kingdom of God in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, why do I want to bother reading something or studying something that has no application? Mm -hmm. But then I started reading it. And Jesus said, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. And I started asking, well, who's going to be slapping whom in heaven? That doesn't make Mm -hmm. sense. Right. Or pray for your enemies. Mm -hmm. Well, if all evil has been vanquished, who would be our enemies in heaven? Mm -hmm. And it came to my realization, this really is for the here and now. And and what Jesus is giving us is a way to live. It's not a checklist for how to mm-hmm. get into heaven. It's a way to experience God's blessings right now. Mm-hmm. You don't have to wait until you die to experience the wow. benefits of living under the rule of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. When you learn to forgive, he has a lot to say in the Sermon on the Mount about forgiveness. Mm-hmm. He said in Matthew 6, right in the smack dab middle of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if you forgive others, you will be forgiven by God. If you don't forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Those okay, are so what does words. that mean? Let's kind of just break down some yeah. of these. I mean, because you, when you read that, it's, well, okay, so if I don't forgive, I'm not going to heaven. I think what he's he's not saying that you earn your salvation by good works. We know that's inconsistent mm-hmm. with Scripture. He's not saying you lose your salvation. Romans eleven twenty nine says the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. But as a counselor, I imagine you've heard this phrase. People say, I will not forgive. Yeah. I refuse to forgive. Mm-hmm. When somebody says that, it's not that they've lost their salvation. It's probably they never had salvation mm-hmm. to begin with. Because when you really understand the great debt that Mm -hmm. God has forgiven you for your sins, Mm -hmm. but you refuse to forgive other people, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is the obligation of those who have been forgiven. We're not asking people to deny the reality Mm -hmm. of their hurt. You know, Joseph said to his brothers who sold him into slavery, you meant it for evil. Mm -hmm. What you did was terrible. It's not denying it. You're not surrendering your desire for justice. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is you're giving up your right to vengeance. Mm. Vengeance is my desire to hurt you for hurting me. When you forgive somebody, you acknowledge they wronged you. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can express the pain that you have felt either to them or to God. But you say, God, I'm giving up my right to hurt this person. I'm asking you or somebody else to settle the score. Yeah. And then that doesn't mean, I mean, just emotion-wise, what happens when you've really... And and it's not forgetting. Forgiveness Mm -hmm. is not forgetting. Forgetting is a biological function. Hmm. Forgiveness is a spiritual function. Uh, But every time when you do make the decision to let go, to let God Mm -hmm. deal with it, to let God settle the score, uh, I just encourage people even to write it down on their Bible, Mm -hmm. in the back leaf of the Bible. I decided to forgive so-and-so, put their initials in there, reverse the initials, Mm -hmm. and write Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ has forgiven you. Anytime you're tempted to grab hold of that offense, just remember that Mm -hmm. you made the decision to let go of it. I will never forget because you're talking about the power of analogies and word pictures. I will always remember you saying during a sermon one time, If you have trouble forgiving, you said this isn't to shame, like this isn't an exercise to like shame you and remind you of your past or anything, but picture a movie theater and the worst sin you've ever committed being on a movie theater uh, projector in front of all your friends and family and then remembering that God has forgiven you of that. And you said, be careful. Like we don't want to shame. We don't remember things that God has forgiven in order to keep us stuck, but it's just to keep us in the right place of understanding. Well, I I think it's a healthy kind of shame just to remember the great debt that you've been Mm -hmm. forgiven. And that's why Paul links it. Forgive one another just as right. God in Christ has forgiven you. And the amazing thing about God's forgiveness is that it doesn't make sense. Like He shouldn't forgive us. Like forgiveness doesn't make sense. Yeah. It doesn't make sense that we're forgiven. So when Sounds people, like a good book title. Uh, forgiveness doesn't make <laughs> when sense. When forgiveness oh. doesn't make sense. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Uh, that's why another that's one, one of, of Dr. Robert books. Jefferson's, <laughs> which is both one of both of our favorites. Um, but it doesn't make sense. So whenever you're like, well, it doesn't make sense for me to forgive this person. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. It's, it's supernatural. I got that title. You know, forgiveness doesn't That's make right. sense, but it's the only way to take care of the hurts of the past. Right. 
That's amazing. We're going to switch gears real quick because there's so many topics in your book. And I don't know if we've had really an episode where you talk about money, which everybody's like, oh, oh man, I'm going to switch this now. <laughs> but what is the Sermon on the Mount and what are some kind of general principles in scripture about finances? Well, it's interesting that Jesus links money with anxiety. Hmm. Worry and wealth go hand in hand. Jesus understood that. People who are wealthy, they have a lot of money. They're worried that they're going to lose it. Mm. And people who don't have money are afraid they'll never have enough. Mm. And uh, Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, mm. but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. And he said, when you're tempted to worry about money, remember the birds of the air. Look at them. They don't stay up at nights trying to balance their checkbook. They don't toil. They have a heavenly father who provides for them. Them, will he not also do so much mm. more for you? Now, the Bible has a lot to say about money right. and, and about careful management of your money and not mm -hmm. going into debt and uh, saving some for the future. But we don't need to worry about money. And, you know, Jesus understood that uh, there are really only three things that can happen with your money, and none of them are really good. <laughs> You're either going to lose it. You're going to have it stolen from you, or you're going to leave it all behind when you hmm. die. But eventually, your life is more than just about your possessions. Wow. Okay, I want to ask you, um, this is funny because I didn't tell you, but what are just some keys to being happy? Like, you know, a lot of times Christians try to over-spiritualize it. Like, oh, it's joy. We need to have joy. Yeah. But is, I mean— Ultimately, miserable Christians don't attract anyone to Christ. I mean, there needs no. to be a happiness generally well, in that our is, disposition. That's the first chapter in this 18 Minutes with Jesus book because it's the first thing Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about happiness. Yeah. He said, blessed. He said it eight times. Blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. Blessed mm -hmm. are those who hunger and thirst. They shall be filled. Blessed are those who surf, uh, suffer for righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of God. That Greek word, blessed, makarios, could be translated happy. Hmm. Uh, some people translate it joyful. But um, I think what Jesus is saying, Julia, is you can be happy. I'm not talking about a superficial giddiness. Nobody mm -hmm. expects you to be happy when you're suffering or right. when you've lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. But joy is that deep inner assurance that no matter what's happening now, God is in control. Mm -hmm. And I really summarize the whole theme of the Sermon on the Mount in this way. Those who model the attitudes and affections and actions of Jesus can experience unshakable joy in this life and unending happiness in the next wow. one. And I use this illustration because you have it eight times in the Beatitudes. He's basically saying, blessed, happy are those who suffer now because they have a great payoff in the end. Uh Present day pain, ultimate gain. And I use this illustration. Just imagine you're having trouble making it day to day financially, mm -hmm. always uh, trying to have enough food for you and your family, wondering, you know, how you're going to survive tomorrow. And you get word that your uncle uh, has put you in his will for $10 million. That sounds and good. that's that's the good news. <laughs> the even better news is he's 99 years old. Uh, now, that knowledge wouldn't necessarily change your day-to-day -day existence, mm -hmm. but it would give you a different perspective about mm -hmm. it. You would think, you know, I can take this because I know what's coming. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. Right. Obey me now. You'll experience joy, a calm assurance, but there is a payoff coming. Mm -hmm. So there's some questions that if you've been in church for a long time or you became a Christian young or you're, you're an adult, um, maybe it's like, oh, man, I've missed I've missed the point where I can raise my hand and ask, ask a question. <laughs> oh. And I think one of those is a lot of times people don't know how to study the Bible. And I just want to talk about this for a second um, as we're about to wrap up, because I remember even just as a pastor's daughter and in church my whole life, there were certain kinds of Bible studies that I didn't really click with. And mm -hmm. it would almost be like, well, what's wrong with you that you don't want to read and study all of the Hebrew and Greek? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, that's just not mm -hmm. necessarily what I connected with. And I know for me, like the way that God speaks to me through scripture, 
is very much practical. Like that's how I learned. That's how I learned in school. But we know we're supposed to be a lifelong student of scripture. But I do think some people worry if they don't connect with a certain kind of studying of scripture that something's wrong with them and they just give it up altogether. Or like a lot of teenagers I talk to, they're just like, and adults, where do I start? Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say like this book is really wonderful about that of giving just practically, this is how you can study the Sermon on the Mount. And then for, you know, how I (laughs) enjoy scripture and this is how it relates in this day and age, what God wants you to do today. But can you just kind of speak to that for people that want to know the Bible, but maybe they don't, they're not super interested or they haven't had a good Bible study experience? Here's what I would say to those listening. The best way I have found to study the Bible, especially if you're getting started, go to the New Testament Mm -hmm. and select one book of the New Testament, like Philippians, Mm -hmm. like Ephesians, one of the shorter books, no more than six chapters, and read that book through once a day, five days a week Mm -hmm. for a month. You'll end up reading it 20 or 30 times. Now you say, how could I do that? Mm -hmm. Most of the books of the New Testament can be read in less than 20 minutes. Wow. So take the book of, let's say, Philippians, read through it on day one. Don't do anything. Mm -hmm. If you run across something that you wonder about, you can underline it. Mm -hmm. But if you'll read that 20 or 30 times in a month, one once a day for each day of the month, you'll know that book backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. Now, when you come to a phrase, have a study Bible that you can look down and say, what does that mean? What's the word there? Mm -hmm. But I have found that's the best way. And when you get through a book like Romans or Matthew Mm -hmm. that is longer, take a third of that book, the Mm -hmm. first six chapters, and Mm -hmm. read it once a day for 30 days, then the next six chapters. And I have found doing that is one of the best ways to study the Bible. That's so good. And just, you know, we're not selling this or anything, but um, I know for me, just kind of seeing all the commentaries and it's like, oh, where do I get started? We just have one at home and it's all of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament and just makes it a lot more manageable. Because the truth is, when you read scripture, there are things where you're like, what does this mean? Start with a good study Bible. Yeah. Even if you can't get a commentary, Mm -hmm. get a good study Bible that will have explanations. Uh, And of course, I use the Ryrie study Mm -hmm. Bible, R Y. R.I.E., named for mm-hmm. Dr. Charles Ryrie, who was a member here for many years. But there are other great study Bibles. Get something that will help you understand yeah. the verse. Oh, that's so good. Okay, so can you just tell us how we can get your book, 18 Minutes with Jesus? And also, I do want to say uh, that you have, it's not a new podcast, but it is officially on iTunes. I definitely consider you to be the best pastor out there. And I'm not the only one who thinks that, but you're a great teaching teacher of scripture and you just make it so easy to understand. Well, I and, appreciate it. Pathway to Victory is our program. Right. And it's uh, on. You can get it at ptv.org along with Unapologetic. Yes. And, uh, and on as, iTunes. And iTunes. Mm-hmm. And the book, 18 Minutes with Jesus, it's available in most bookstores, but always on Amazon. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to be with you. And again, congratulations on Unapologetic. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Unapologetic. Remember that you can hear today's episode and more at ptv.org slash Julia and wherever you get your podcasts. Stay connected with Julia and Unapologetic on all social media channels. By doing so, you'll be the first to hear about new episodes and other news. To follow Julia and Unapologetic on social media, go to ptv.org slash Julia. Julia.